Hey there, church family. Let's start today with Jeremiah chapter 15. We'll read verses 5 to 9, and then we'll skip ahead to 19 and 21. Who will have pity on you, O Jerusalem? Or who will bemoan you? Who will turn aside to ask about your welfare? You have rejected me, says the Lord. You are going backward, so I have stretched out my hand against you and destroyed you. I am weary of relenting. I have winnowed them with a winnowing fork. In the gates of the land I have bereaved them. I have destroyed my people. They did not turn from their ways. Their widows became more numerous than the sand of the seas. I have brought against the mothers of use a destroyer at noonday. I have made anguish and terror fall upon her suddenly. She who bore seven has languished. She has swooned away. Her son went down while it was yet day. She has been shamed and disgraced, and the rest of them I will give to the sword before their enemies, says the Lord. We'll skip ahead to verse 19 now. Therefore, thus says the Lord, if you turn back, I will take you back, and you shall stand before me. If you utter what is precious and not what is worthless, you shall serve as my mouth. It is they who will turn to you, not you who will turn to them. And I will make you to this people a fortified wall of bronze. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail over you. For I am with you to save you and deliver you, says the Lord. I will deliver you out of the hand of the wicked and redeem you from the grasp of the ruthless. Now we'll uh, read Luke chapter 14, verses 25 to 33. Now large crowds were traveling with them, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost, to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to wage war against another king will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot then, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore... None of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. I admittedly don't always want to give a message. There are certain times where I'm like, ah, man, I really don't want to give this message because it's a little more blunt or it's a little more forceful than I generally like to be. It's a little bit more intense or honest than people sometimes actually want to hear. Well, today I'm called to give a message that's a little tough to give, and God has placed two questions on my heart. And these questions are, why do we exist as a church, and why do we call ourselves Christians? That's a pretty tough question to answer, you know? It's a little tough to be that honest with yourself of why do we exist as a church, and why do we call ourselves Christians? The sermon here, it's a little bit of a hard pill to swallow. It's not warm. It's not fuzzy. It's not feel good. This sermon is to make every single one of us ask, am I good enough? Now, before we begin, let's start with a little icebreaker to kind of break some of the tension. Um, that's why not, why not try to start on a positive note, you know? But all right. How do you know the wise men were firefighters? They came from afar. Whoever wrote that one must have been Pennsylvania Dutch. Get it? A far, a fire. <laughs> uh, the other one is, which Old Testament prophet was an orphan? Joshua, because he came from none. Didn't. <laughs> but anyway, okay, now that we are in good spirits, I hope you found them as humorous as I did. I love a good dad joke. Let's go down this journey of self-discovery together. Something happened to me this last week that made me think about our walk with God. 
I was trying to check my blood sugar. And to do that, you have to prick your finger and draw a little bit of blood to put that little bit of blood into the reader. I've done it before. I knew I knew the prick didn't really hurt, uh, but my mother, she was always the one that would press the button to prick my finger. She has diabetes, and every so often she would check mine just to make sure that my levels were okay. And so recently she gave me one of her old blood checkers. So I'm trying to do it myself for the very first time because I haven't done a whole lot recently. Um, some health scares recently. So I'm like, oh, let's keep an eye on this. So she gave me one of her old blood checkers. I'm sitting there and <laughs> I have my finger on the butt. Like I have the thing pressed up. Let's say this pen is the blood checker. I have it pressed up against my finger. And let's say here, this is the button. So I'm sitting there and just cannot bring myself to press down on this button. I know it doesn't hurt. I know actually that it's for my own good to check my blood sugar to make sure I am not pre-diabetic. But it's a little tough to go against that natural survival instinct of, hey, don't make yourself bleed. Don't bring yourself pain. You know, that's an ingrained survival instinct in our minds. Avoid pain if that possible. And I thought to myself, isn't surrendering to God the same thing? We know it's for our own good. But that's an easier said than done thing. It's easy to say you just press a button. It's easy to say it doesn't hurt. But doing it is a little different than saying it. And surrendering to God is the same way. We know it's good. We know it's for our best interests. But it's a little harder to do it than to just say it. And Jeremiah, before we begin with chapter 15 that we read today, I would like to share Jeremiah 14, 10 to 12. It's a good setup here. Jeremiah 14, 10 to 12 says, Thus says the Lord concerning this people, Truly they have loved to wonder. They have not restrained their feet. Therefore the Lord does not accept them. Now he will remember their iniquity and punish their sins. The Lord said to me, Do not pray for their welfare of this people. Although they fast, I do not hear their cry. And although they offer burnt offering and grain offering, I do not accept them. But by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence, I will consume them. I want to start there because these people thought of themselves as religious. And they fasted, they offered their burnt offerings. They thought they were doing right by the Lord because, well, they're doing what God commanded, right? They're doing these religious services. But they wondered. And they still went their own way. They lived for themselves. They lived for their earthly desires, even though they knew what God expected. They knew God expected more than just these religious services, but actually for them to attain in life to follow him. But they were living for themselves. They sought earthly pleasures. God told Jeremiah that their religious rituals would not save them because they did not really mean it. You see, that's the big difference there. They went through the motions, but they didn't actually mean it. Going through the motions of religious practice, i.e. coming to church, praying, reading scripture, you know, these things that we know we should do, but that's not the same as putting the whole heart into it. Our whole heart should go into reading scripture. Our whole heart should go into going to church. Our whole heart should be into prayer. It's not about just going through the motions. It's actually about meaning what we're doing. I'm not telling you not to go to church. I'm not telling you to not pray. I'm not telling you to stop reading scripture. But we should examine our own hearts when we do these things. Why are we doing them? Out of obligation? Out of religious adherence? Or is it actually trying to benefit our own souls and grow closer to God because we love God? So our reading today in chapter 15 that started with God saying nobody would pity Jerusalem at this punishment that was going to be carried out. God said very plainly that it was because they rejected him. He said, you are going backward. And he was weary of relenting. God has been patient for a long time with Jerusalem. God has given so many warnings. He's cried out to his chosen people so many times. And enough was enough. A sinful, selfish life, that's finally caught up to Jerusalem. So God said he made anguish and terror fall upon her suddenly. Is any of this starting to sink in? Is any of this starting to hit a little close to home? Because as I said, this is going to be a hard pill to swallow. 
But when God said he wintered them with a winnowing fork, this was an allegory of a farming practice. Grain, it was thrown into the air, and the grain fell onto the floor. And the chaff, it would blow away in the wind. So the useless things were blown away in the wind. They were thrown into exile. They were thrown into chaos. The good grain stayed behind. John the Baptist, he used this exact same imagery in Luke chapter 3, verse 17. John the Baptist said, His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff would burn with unquenchable fire. Are we the grain or are we the chaff? Are we going through a religious motion or do we mean it? This is intense. So is there hope? Is there hope from this punishment? Well, I'll tell you what. With God, there's always hope. Always hope. Because as Jeremiah 15, 19 says, if you turn back, I will take you back. God wants Jerusalem to turn back sincerely, not religious traditions, but true devotion to him. Later still in verse 19, if you utter what is precious and not what is worthless, you will serve as my mouth. What is precious and what is worthless? God wants us to speak holy truth, not useless rhetoric. Not heresy or apostasy, not hateful or perverse speech, only truth. That is what God wants from us. God warned Jeremiah that people would hate him. They would rise up against him. But he would be protected. God will protect those that speak truth. The wicked, they'll rise up. But God will protect those who stand up for him. Now, in our Luke reading today, Jesus, he had a lot of followers, uh, but they were the kind from Jeremiah's time. They were the same yoke, more or less. <laughs> they weren't all in. They were culturally religious, but they were not truly religious. Religious, by definition, it means devotion to God or spiritual faith. So technically, when somebody says, I'm spiritual, but not religious, that, that's kind of an oxymoron. To be religious is to be spiritual. But honestly, I do understand that sentiment because religion has done a lot of harm in history. But that was not true religion. That, true religion did not do that harm. The religion that did so much harm was the very religion that God despised in our Jeremiah reading today. It's all rhetoric, but not true dedication or understanding to God. So when somebody says, I'm spiritual, but not religious, be like, well, if you're spiritual, that means you are religious. And those that are just doing a lot of rhetoric or uh, are making things just work for them, that's not true religion. <laughs> anyway, but Jesus told these people in Luke 14, 26, whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself cannot be my disciple. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. Aren't we to love our neighbor? Aren't we to honor our mother and father? So now, Jesus, you're telling me that I should hate my parents? I should hate my siblings, my spouse, my children? Jesus, are you telling me I should even hate myself? What about loving our neighbor and honoring our mother and father? <laughs> well, I mean, this message is obviously meant to be understood as hyperbole. You know, Jesus warned that he'd bring division amongst families. Uh, Jesus warned people that. Uh, were they willing to leave their families to follow Jesus? That was the question. So this would have been a very controversial statement then. Still is today. I mean, family was very important in ancient Jewish culture. And family is still, to this day, very important to people. So it's a controversial statement. But are we willing to leave our families and follow Jesus? Then Jesus told these followers that they had to pick up their crosses and follow him. Not halfway, but the whole way, the whole way to crucifixion. If they built a tower or if they went to war, obviously they would sit down and they would plan out the cost. To go only halfway, that's breeding failure. It's breeding defeat. A half-built tower is a monument to failure. A defeated army is showing that there was a lack of strength and there was a lack of tactic in the battle plan. So Jesus was saying, you need to know the cost and to follow through then. I want you to know the cost of following me. And then if 
you still decide to follow me, I want you to follow through. Jesus, when he told them that, it is just as important for us today. Jesus is still telling us this today. Luke 14, 33. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. Jesus wants our full dedication. Jesus wants our time. Jesus wants our focus. Jesus wants our money. Jesus wants every fiber of our being. There's no such thing as a half a Christian. Either you are a Christian or you are not a Christian. So, as I asked early in this message, when I started, why do we call ourselves Christians? Because there's no halfway. Nothing you love can be as important as God. No ifs, ands, or buts. Not your job, not your spouse, not your children, not your hobby. Nothing. That's a hard pill to swallow, but it's true. We cannot put anything before God and call ourselves a disciple of Christ. In the beginning, I said, we should ask ourselves, are our are we good enough? Am I good enough? Honestly, no, because none of us are good enough. But God is enough. God sacrificed himself for us. Are we sacrificing for God? Do we sacrifice our time or our talents, our attention, our finances? Do we sacrifice that for God? In Genesis 22, God commanded Abraham to go and sacrifice his son Isaac in Moriah. Now, I'm sure most people know this account, uh, and, you know, I can only make so much of a sermon, I got a time limit, but I want to make two big points from this account. First, Abraham, he had faith that God would provide. When Isaac asked about where the offering was, he said, we got the wood and everything, but where's, where's the offering? Abraham replied, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. I believe Abraham had faith that God would not kill his son. Abraham had faith that God had a plan. Secondly, even though Abraham knew God had a plan, he still was willing to sacrifice his son. He had the knife raised. I mean, he did. He had the knife raised. And an angel said to stop. Don't kill the boy. That a ram, it was then offered in Isaac's place as the ram was caught in a briar patch. God said in Genesis 22, 16, 18, by myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will indeed bless you, and I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars of heaven, and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offering shall possess the gate of their enemies, and by your offering shall all the nations of the earth gain blessing for themselves, because you have obeyed my voice. Jesus said to not even let family get in the way of serving him. This was not, not a new commandment because God did the same thing to Abraham. How's this hard pill going down? The cut and dry message of this is we love to wonder, just like Israel in the book of Jeremiah. We love searching for earthly pleasure, even though we claim to follow God. God called us back through Jesus Christ. But to come back, we have to take up our crosses and follow him. Follow him the whole way up to the crucifixion, not just, not just to the foot of the hill, the whole way up it. Mega churches, they get a lot of flack. Mega churches do. They, they, they got a bad name to them usually uh, because you can just slide in unnoticed and not have to put any work in. You get go in and get entertained basically like you're at a concert and you leave. It's an entertainment industry, more or less. But here's the thing, and we don't like to admit this is true, but our small churches... They're no different. They're not. People like to slide in, sing a couple hymns, hear the message, read scripture, and move on with life. Go take care of a Sunday lunch or whatever. 21st century Christianity, if we are being honest with ourselves, and that is what I am asking people to do today, is be honest with ourselves. 21st century Christianity is no different than the ancient Jewish practices. Religious rhetoric. Religious practices, going through the motions. We need to stop attending church and we need to start doing church. We need to carry our crosses the whole way up to Calvary. We need to sacrifice our very selves to God because he sacrificed so much for us. We need to push the button on the blood checker, so to speak, because it's for our own good. Even though it involves a little blood, it is for our own good. We need to stop attending church. We need to start doing church. Why do we call ourselves Christians? 
Why do we call ourselves a church? These are important things that as 21st century Christians, we need to start tackling. Because God didn't ask us to only go halfway. He wanted us to pick up our crosses and follow him. Are we following? Remember, God loves you and I love you. Have a blessed week.